Welcome to Boulder Mountain. If you're a guest with us, my name's Kyle, and I would love the opportunity to say hi to you, meet you after service. If you haven't given us your contact information, we'd love to be able to get that. Just as a way to answer questions you might have about the church, follow up with you. Our goal here is that everyone would be known, and no matter who you are, God sees you this morning. And I invite you to t grab a Bible if you don't have one, we have some provided for you in the back of the room, or you can pull it up on your device. But the final week of a four-week series where we're looking at two specific characters. We spent two weeks on the man named Nicodemus in John chapter 3, and we're spending two weeks on the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. And just for ease and simplicity for us to remember this, Nick at night and Sam at noon. And we look at the second passage of the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4. Before we look at verses 27 through 42, begin today just by saying, regardless of where you find yourself today, we've all been at some point in our life, we've been in a mess. We've been in a mess. You can't pray your way out of a mess that your behavior got yourself into. You can't work yourself out of a mess that your behavior got yourself into. But you can follow your way out by following the person, the work of Jesus. No matter who you are today, no matter where you find yourself today, no matter what's happened in your life based on decisions you've made or decisions that have been made about you, that is true. There's an invitation for you to come to know the person and the work of Jesus today. And if you don't know him, I pray that the course of the next few min minutes, you would get to know who he is and how much he loves you. He sees you today. He knows your name. John chapter 4, verse 27. If you missed last week and go online, you can watch the first week of Jesus' interaction with the Samaritan woman at the end of their conversation, which, so you're aware, is the longest conversation one-on-one -on -one anyone in Scripture has with Jesus is the Samaritan woman. It's the longest recorded conversation in the Bible is, is this woman. It's not Nicodemus, the religious man, the wealthy man, the man of power, the man of influence, the moral man. It's the immoral woman, irreligious, from Samaria, and we broke that down last week. It's the longest conversation. At the end of it, there was just Jesus and her. Verse 27, after Jesus reveals to her that he is the Messiah. First time he reveals to anyone that he's the Messiah, he reveals it to her. Just then his disciples came back and they had all these thoughts. I wonder if they passed her as she's heading into town. They're coming out of town. Remember they went to fast food? They went into town to grab Subway and they're bringing food back to Jesus. That's the context. They're coming out of town. She's going into town. I wonder if they passed each other and they made eye contact or they saw from a distance that Jesus is talking to this woman and they had all these questions in their mind. What's, what's he doing talking to her? What do you seek or why are you talking with her? But they only thought it. And now disciples, they picked up on a few things. After a while being around Jesus, they realized we're not going to ask questions anymore. You ask them. I'm not going to ask them. They're all thinking the same thing, but nobody's asking him, right? So John says, they, we all thought it, but nobody asked. And I think they, they did that out of reverent respect. Because every time they had a question or they questioned why Jesus was doing what he was doing, he had, he had a reason. Jesus has a reason to do the things that, that he does. And so even though they thought it, the disciples asked, meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. I'm sorry, I jumped ahead. Uh, verse 28, so the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and they were coming to him. So the disciples come in with their food. They're going to have a conversation with Jesus about you need to eat. But she, after the conversation, she realized there's a man here who knows everything about me and did not condemn me, and he loves me. I can't keep this to myself. I have to go into town. 
There's a sense of urgency about her. Why do we know that? She leaves the only thing she had there at the moment that we're told of that was a matter of life and death. That was what she used to draw water out in order to survive there. She leaves that behind. When was the last time you, you were so excited to tell somebody about what God's done in your life that you left things behind? Can you think of the moment? Can you think of the time? For some of us, it might have been the first time we realized the grace of the gospel and we said yes to Jesus. And we couldn't wait to tell somebody. It might have been the friend who invited us, or it might have been a parent, or it might have been a pastor, it might have been a camp counselor. Who was it that you ran to to tell of the work that God's done in your life? So much so that you forgot. You forgot something. You forgot maybe the most important material possession that you own. You, you couldn't wait to go tell somebody of what God's done in your life. This is the Samaritan woman. Now, what's fascinating, she's running to tell the people who've rejected her. She is an outcast. That's why she's going to the well in the middle of the day. She's going to the very people who knew everything about her and they rejected her and condemned her. Now she runs into town and says, there's a man who knows everything about me. Now, it's really interesting. She doesn't say, I just met the Messiah. I don't think they would have taken her at her word. I don't believe they would have believed her had she said, I just met I just met the Messiah. But she's really shrewd in how she phrases this. Could it be? I just met a man who knows everything about me. And he didn't condemn me. He didn't do what you've done to me. You know my past. You know my story. And you've rejected me. I just met a man who knows everything about me. And he didn't reject me. He accepted me. And I can't keep this to myself. Has there been a time in your life? It's always fun when someone comes to know Christ. They can't, they can't contain it. They have to tell someone. And if that's happened in your life or if that hasn't happened, when it does happen for you personally, tell as many people as possible. It's healthy to tell the story. When people get baptized or posting videos all online, they, they want to tell the world that I now declare on my life with Jesus. I'm publicly letting everybody know I'm with him and he's with me. When was the last time you made a decision in your life, a faith decision, and you got so excited you couldn't wait to tell everybody? If, if it's been a few years, if it's been a few years, it's time to take another step of faith, friends. Have you ever sensed this urgency, this urgency that I can't wait for the conversation I just had? Now, I want to set the context here. I didn't have time last week to do it. But I don't know if recently, maybe you saw a movie over Thanksgiving week and we're heading into the, the Hallmark Christmas movies, you know, which you never know what's going to happen, right? <laughs> I want to set a typecast or a type scene with you. What the author John is doing in this text, he's, he's setting the stage for us where every reader is going to immediately go back to this pattern at the well. And I'm going to talk through it. I want you to think, where is your well? Where do you go to intentionally to be around people who do not know Jesus? Is it the, the senior center? Is it the cafeteria at school? Where you intentionally are sitting at tables, you're intentionally going to places that might make you uncomfortable but you know there are people who don't know Jesus. There's the story of Abraham, who God tells, hey, I'm going to bless you so that you can be a blessing to others. And he realizes, hey, we have a son, but my son is not married, and so he's going to need a wife if this whole thing is going to come to fruition. So he sends a servant to a well. And he tells the servant, when you get to that well, I want you to stop and I want you to pray. And the servant does as he's commanded, and he's before he stops praying, he opens his eyes and there's a woman at the well. And that's where Isaac meets Rebecca in Genesis 24. And there's a pattern that happens. And the same happens with Jacob and Rachel. Jacob meets Rachel at a well. A man goes on a journey and he meets a woman at a well. And the woman gets him a drink. 
And then the woman runs back home with news, with good news. And then what happens? There's hospitality given to the man that was met the woman at the well. This is a pattern that happens over and over and over in Scripture. And so there's a typecast, right? Let me, it's the movie. You're watching the horror movie. And when everybody in the horror movie gets separated, you know something bad's about to happen. Nobody's going to live. It's the old Western where you know the sheriff's going to draw his gun a lot faster than the bad guy. We're reading the story of the well. A man goes to a well and meets a woman, and there's a typecast happening. And John is drawing on this. The woman draws the water. The woman runs home. Hospitality is given to the man. And then at the end, there is a joining, there is a union that takes place. Now, in each of those in the Old Testament stories, it's marriage. So as the reader, you're reading through this, you're thinking, what's going on here? Is there going to be a marriage that, that happens here? A joining of two parties. There's hospitality. So as we're reading this, and you're like, well, maybe those are just two stories of coincidence. Let me keep going. Moses and Zipporah. Moses leaves Egypt, and he runs into a woman. He actually runs into seven women, and he defends them all, and he ends up meeting his wife at the well. I ask you again, where's your well? Where do you go throughout the week to meet with people who are far from God. And so as we read this passage in John chapter 4, and we, we get through this passage, now we see her running back home with good news. You see this? She's running back home. Now what's going to happen? There's going to be hospitality given. And we're going to see that with Jesus. Jesus comes into town. He spends two days with them. And then where's, where's the union and where's the joining that happens? In John chapter 3, after he has a conversation with Jesus, John writes that Jesus is called, for the first time in Scripture, he's called the groom. Jesus is called the bridegroom. And throughout Scripture, the church is called the bride. You and I are the bride of Christ. What, what did the groom do for his bride? He gave his life for his bride. And so you look at this text here. Samaritan woman's at the well. He meets a man, offers him something to drink, goes through this whole type. There's hospitality. The woman runs home to share news. Hospitality is given. There's a joining that's going to take place. There's a union that's going to take place. Throughout this series, we've been hearing different testimonies from different people within our church. And I've challenged you, and if you've not done this, I, I'm going to encourage you. I'm going to give you a deadline now. The deadline's by the end of the year. I do better with deadlines because I do it the night before the deadline, right? <laughs> and so maybe you'll have an interesting New Year's Eve this year. But would you take a few moments, for those of you who know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and be reminded of that moment when you gave your life to him. You'd be reminded of the grace when you cross the line of faith, when you write your story down. So here's the homework. That you would write your story down. Now, there's longer versions of our story, and there's shorter versions of our story, and I'd I believe you should be able to share your story in an elevator, right? Going to the fifth floor, can you share your story in 30 seconds? Then we all have longer stories, right? And none of our stories are completely over. There's still chapters being written. But if you haven't taken the time to just stop and reflect and write your story down, I encourage you to do that. Every week we've been hearing a story. I'm so grateful for Isaac as he comes to stage. Isaac is our worship director. And Isaac and Zoe have been in our church since October and he's been leading our students. He's been leading us in worship. And Isaac, thanks for taking a few moments to share your story with us uh, this morning. <laughs> you guys are too nice. No, uh, Pastor Kyle asked me to do this earlier this week. And I was like, oh, yeah, no problem. Um, and then I found it was actually, it's really hard. Um, <laughs> Especially, he's like, oh, keep it three to five minutes. You run through it, and it's 25. You're like, hmm, it's a little. Um, there's two things I really want to capitalize on, I think, when I share my testimony. And it's God's unconditional love, and it's accepting that we're, we're not perfect, that I'm not perfect. Um, and I have notes if I have to pull that out. Please forgive me. Again, trying to keep it to that five minutes. Um, I grew up in a, in a pretty toxic home life that was surrounded around my mom who struggled with addiction. 
um, the various drugs for as, as long as I remember it. Um, this became more apparent when I was a teenager and I didn't really accept it until I was an adult. Um, but ultimately this, this led to her, she was a, a very abusive person. Um, and uh, she was, uh, she, she struggled with mental health. She struggled with mental health a lot. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Um, when I was 14, uh, I, uh, sorry, I'm sorry. <clears throat> I love the youth. Except when they're shaving my head, then I don't love them as much. <laughs> um, no, but uh, I was 14. I witnessed my mom have a mental breakdown. Um, and not only that, but at the same time, I was having to go into a pretty in invasive leg surgery um, because I had a benign tumor as a kid. Uh, it affected my growth in my, in my right leg, so I had to go through what they call the Taylor spatial frame where they break your leg in three spots and they use an external frame to put it back. It was very scary surgery for me as a 14 year old with everything else that makes being 14 hard. Um, but before I even went into that surgery and I was in that spot when I was terrified, I had already witnessed my mom in this place. Um, I was in a really low, low place. I had a friend invite me to youth group and I actually got to share this with the youth. Um, and that night, we did the regular games, the regular worship. And the worship leader said, uh, if you guys want to take a moment to pray, I want to open that for you right now. And I prayed for the first time. Um, you know, maybe, maybe I prayed beforehand and it was saying, now I lay me down to sleep as fast as I could before I went to bed. But I didn't grow up in the church. I didn't really grow up around religion. So this was big for me. And um, I, I didn't know what to say. You know, I, I didn't have a script or anything. <laughs> but I just kept saying, God, I want things to be better. And I think I said it several times under my breath. Uh, a couple months after that, um, I started dating Zoe, my wife to this day. I got to know her family. Um, her dad is a youth pastor, and they both have... Her parents have fantastic hearts. They're a great household, and they've been very good to me. My dad invited me to church, which was very out of the blue. Again, I didn't grow up in the church. Um, so I was like, oh, okay, yeah, I'll go to church. I met the pastor um, who took the time to develop a relationship with me. Um, and before you knew it, I was playing bass on the worship team. And that worship team, they treated me like their own. Um, I'm still really good friends with the worship leader. Um, in fact, he was actually one of my references for uh, my job here. Um, but I wish, you know, you could go oh, happily ever after, that's it. Doesn't mean because you accept a life with God, it doesn't mean everything's going to be perfect. And you hear that again and again, but to actually say it and to accept that is it's a different thing. Um, as an adult, I can tell you, I, I still struggle with trauma. I still struggle with PTSD. I don't have a very good relationship with my family. That's really hard to say to you guys right now. Again, I wish I could just say everything's perfect. Um, this brings me into this is I've struggled with accepting that I'm, I'm not a perfect person. In a lot of ways, I'm a broken person. And how, how could I be a worship leader if I'm not perfect? Because if you're, if you're in the church and you're a leader, you have to be a certain example. You have to be perfect. <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> and honestly, like, I, I, I feel like maybe, maybe you're sitting in here right now and, and you came in today thinking, it actually breaks my heart to say this, maybe you're thinking you don't belong here. And I, that's, that's, don't, don't let those voices get to you. Amen. I'm really happy you're here today. I'm happy each and every one of you is here today. Um, I want to leave you guys with this. And this is, uh, this is talking about God's unconditional love. And even though things don't, always, uh, things don't always look exactly the way you want it to, 
God has a way of working things out. And um, struggling with my, my, uh, my trauma, I was having a panic attack one day, and I opened my Bible. And what I turned to was 2 Timothy 1.7. And I'm going to read it here so I don't get it wrong. For God has not given spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Amen. You know, God, God knows what we can handle. And sometimes he's going to pull you through the fire, but he's there. He's listening. Thank you for letting me share today, everyone. Yeah, that takes a tremendous amount of courage. And so thank you, Isaac, for being willing to do that. It's a little different when you're not holding an instrument, right? Yeah. <laughs> but I've got a question for you. One of the things that I love about Isaac and, and Zoe, their ministry here in the church, but their ministry outside the walls of this church as well. Isaac's a part of a few different bands, and those bands are his well for him to rub shoulders in different environments and different places. And so talk about, talk about that, Isaac, and you know, why you feel like God's called you into some of those environments. Yeah, and, and you know, I think I even mentioned during prayer, or during worship, excuse me, that um, what we do here today doesn't just stop in these walls, it leaves with us. Um, there's two important things, I think, when being a disciple that are really important, or being a teacher that are that is important to consider. And um, one thing we talk about as educators, if you're not aware of this, I'm a music educator, is what we call culturally relevant, the key words relevant pedagogy. And um, there's a reason, it's the same reason we, we don't wear what we did 100 years ago to church. We don't sing hymns as common. We um, don't say thous and yees and these thous. Would, <laughs> I'm getting tongue-tied just saying it, right? We teach things in a way that's relevant and meaningful without sacrificing the content. That being said, it's really hard to do that if you trap yourself in the church, if you trap yourself, if you put the blinders on, if you're open to understanding people, you know, it's, it's funny, even getting to know people, getting to know people who don't know Christ, if you start the conversation with, oh, I'm a worship leader, I'm a pastor, typically that's going to close doors pretty fast. That's not how you get to know people. It's not how you get to build relationship most of the time. If you start it with, hey, how are you doing? Hey, did you watch that game? The D-backs, eh, they didn't do so good. Um, Are you going to rub it in? Yeah. <laughs> so I don't even, I, I didn't even know it was a baseball team until <laughs> a couple weeks ago. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so um, but keeping it in a way that's relevant, but also making sure that you're getting out there and you're actually getting to reach those people just like Jesus did, just like Jesus did to the Samaritan woman. You're getting to know people who aren't here today, who haven't taken that step or haven't even been invited to take that step yet. I think the same way I was invited to youth group for the, for the first time. Yeah, thank you, Isaac. I appreciate Isaac and his ministry. On the weekends, he's playing in bars on Friday and Saturday night. And as I say that, some of you, it makes you uncomfortable. There are, there are people in bars who need to be rubbing shoulders with people who are followers of Jesus. Now, it would not be wise for all of us, right? There's someone in the room who say, it wouldn't be wise for me to be in a bar. And so it's the, your context. What is God calling you to go in that environment? Where is he calling you to go to be with people who are, who are far from God? So I really appreciate you using your skills and talents, not just here. Grateful that you're leading us here, but also as a starving artist out, out in the world as well. So, <laughs> thanks, Isaac. Thanks for, thanks for sharing. So take a moment and think of your story and the environments and experiences and relationships that God's placed in your life to draw him, yourself to him. The Samaritan woman runs into town as part of her story. And pick up the text. 
Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him to eat, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to him, I have food to eat that you do not know of. So the disciples said to one another, we'll jump down. There are yet four months, okay? Uh, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months and comes the harvest? This is a proverbial saying, very similar to like we say, Rome was not built in a day, right? It's the time will come. But Jesus is, is challenging this, saying, no, the harvest is ripe right now. Lift up your eyes and see the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life. So that sower and reaper may rejoice together. Three things Jesus says here. He talks about sowing and reaping. Some of us are sowing seeds. Every invitation you give is a seed being planted. You might see the rewards of that. You might not. Someone else may come along later and reap that harvest. But number one, Jesus will reward us based on how we use our time, treasure, and our talents on earth. There will be a reward giving he's talking about. Number two, it is an eternal, uh, the fruit, this is eternal fruit. There are a lot of things you and I will go do tomorrow on Monday that are not eternal. But when you invest in the kingdom, that is eternal. That will last forever. When you give someone an invitation, when you share your story, and you give them an invitation to the gospel, that will last for eternity. And the third, the third thing Jesus is telling us, hey, we will all take place in the celebration and at Boulder Mountain, one of our values is we celebrate. When one person comes to know Jesus, we all celebrate. Not just the person who invited that individual. Not just for the one person who invited Isaac to youth group. The whole church celebrates when one person comes to faith in Christ. And although it took maybe dozens of people were a part of that decision. It took the, the person who greeted someone as they walked in. It took the person who was their friend. It took the person who greeted them here in the room. It took the person, their neighbor. It took a lot of different people. But we all celebrate when someone gives their life to Jesus as a church. We all celebrate. For here the saying holds true. One sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. I think of the first missionary couple who left the United States, who left America to go overseas. Adoniram Judson. He goes to the country of Burma, which is now Myanmar, borders Nepal, borders China, small nation. They were under English rule at the time. He goes there and he sacrifices so much. The fruit that he saw with his own eyes was minimal. But after his death, millions came to faith through his ministry. But he sacrificed three of his children. Three of his children were lost, or died of sickness. He was married three times. His first two wives died. He was in prison for 12 years during the English war when they came to, there was a war, English and the Burmese wars. He was in prison for 12 years. He was sowing seeds that others reaped long after his life. What does that look like for you and for I to sow seeds? Where is your well? Where are you sharing your story? What environments, what places? Listen, it's really easy to think about. When we look at Nicodemus, when we look at the Samaritan woman, it's really easy to think about. I, I, if I was a betting man, I bet it would have been Nicodemus who would have said yes to Jesus. He was the religious person. He was the moral person. Everything about him looked clean and tidy and nice. That's the person I think is going to say yes to Jesus. And for all of us in the room, it's really easy for us to think about the person. I don't think they're ever going to give their life to Christ. And Let's not be somebody's no, all right? We have an opportunity as a church with live nativity coming up in a couple of weeks. It's an invitation. It's an opportunity for you to simply invite. Don't be somebody's no. You never know what God will do with a simple invitation. As Isaac just stood here and shared, a simple invitation when he was 14 changed the directory of his entire life, changed his life brought healing, brought recovery to, to him. And that's it's an ongoing, right? That lasts our whole life. None of us have it all figured out. The Samaritan woman probably still had some things she had to wrestle through, but she met Jesus and everything changed. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. So she runs into the town. She asks some questions. Hey, do you think that could be the Messiah? They all go out to the well. 
The whole town says many in the town go out to the well. Because of her testimony, what was her testimony? He told me all the things that I've ever did. So when the Samaritans came, and yet he did not condemn me, he still loved me, and the same is true. Let me say it again. No matter who you are or what you've done or what's been done to you, Jesus loves you. He sees you. He does not condemn you. Your sin condemns you. He does not condemn you. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. There's the hospitality. Remember I told you the type scene. The hospitality. He, Jesus, Rabbi, come into our town, our Samaritan town and stay for two days. He stays there for two days in Samaria teaching. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you have said that we believe. For we have heard for ourselves. We know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. The Savior of Samaria? No. The Savior of Israel? No. The Savior of the world. This is significant what's happening here. Number one, it is you are not saved based on the testimony of someone else. Right? You're not saved based on the testimony of your parents. You're not saved based on the testimony of our worship leader. You're not saved based on the testimony of your spouse. Jesus is personal. He's moving toward you. You have a story. What are you going to do with Jesus? They said, it's no longer because of you. It started with her. The first evangelist in the Bible is a Samaritan woman. Do you understand the irony of this? The very first Samaritan, the very first Evangelist, some would say the first missionary is, is the Samaritan woman who runs into town and says, I, I think I met this Messiah. For we have heard for ourselves, and this is, this is really important, we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. Do you know how foreign of a concept for even those words to be uttered? The Savior of the world. In John 3 and John 4, we, we see this both. Jesus says to Nicodemus, listen, for God so loved the world, if it's been a few years since you gave your life, since you crossed the line of faith, put your name in that verse. Put your name in John 3, 16. For God so loved Kyle. Put your, put your name in there. Be reminded of the great grace and sacrifice that Jesus gave for you, regardless of what we've done, regardless of our past. Now here they heard, and I'm sure this came apart with the two days of teaching that Jesus had in the town. Listen, Jesus sat at and shared meals with the Samaritans. He, he slept in their homes. He rubbed shoulders with them. He spent time with them. A Jewish rabbi, this, this hadn't been done before. Jesus does a lot of things that have never been done before. And they came to recognize that Jesus is the savior of Israel. No, of the world. What do I mean by that? Why is that so significant? When sin first enters into the world, God clothes Adam and Eve by killing animals for, so that they might have coverings. Early on in Genesis, you see one lamb for one individual. Later on at Passover, you see one lamb for a household. And the nation of Israel are told to cover their doors with the, with the blood of the lamb that will save their household. Later on, at the Day of Atonement, the nation of Israel, the high priest, takes one lamb, and that one lamb covers the entire nation. But in John chapter 1, John the Baptist sees Jesus, and he says, Behold, the lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the what? The world. Do you know who that includes? Me. It includes you. It includes the people, every person that you've ever met, every person you've ever laid eyes on, it includes them. The people you think they don't deserve it. You know what? That was me. I don't deserve it either. Every person that you will come in contact with the rest of today, tomorrow, the rest of this week is part of the Savior of the world. He is their Savior, and it's our job. We are plan A, Boulder Mountain. Plan A. There's no plan B. This is our opportunity to share to run back into town, to run out of these doors and tell people, I think I met the Savior. Come see for yourself. 
We have an opportunity. It's live nativity. Are you into Christmas? Yeah, I'm into Christmas. Yeah, me too. I'd love to invite you. It'd be a great time. Come here. Come experience it for yourself. So that one day they can say, I met the Savior. I met Jesus as my Savior, my personal Lord and Savior. If we looked at this Nicodemus and this Samaritan woman I, early on, I would have bet it would, it's Nicodemus. I'm putting all my money on Nicodemus of these two, right? But Jesus, Jesus didn't see it that way. He shares the gospel with both of them. Now, Nicodemus takes a little bit longer. And you know what the big difference was between Nicodemus and the Samaritan woman? It's this really important virtue in the Christian life. And I don't know where you're at when it comes to humility. Humility is required for you to say yes to Jesus. Because in order to say yes to Jesus, you need to recognize that you're, you're a sinner. I, I've made choices. I've made decisions that have gone against God's desire for my life. That takes humility. Humility is a chief virtue. And Tim Keller has a saying that, Humility is really shy. It's the most shy characteristic because every time you bring it up, it goes away. When you start talking about your own personal humility, all of a sudden it's gone, right? Where are you at? You don't need to raise hands or answer out loud, but on a scale of one to 10, where is your humility? Is there humility in your life? Are you able to say, I'm sorry? Are you able to recognize wrong in your life? Are you able to recognize your mistakes? I'm sorry, I was wrong. This, is, this hurt you and I, I went my own way, but... It takes humility to come to know Jesus. You, you can't not have humility and still give your life to Jesus. The Samaritan woman recognized that long before Nicodemus recognized that. Nicodemus said, what must I do? And for all of us, one day we're going to stand before Jesus. He's the question, right, that's been so famously asked over the years. It's not in Scripture, but we have a sanctified imagination, if we will, here this morning. And we, the question that we think he might ask is, why should I let you into heaven? I don't think he's going to ask that. But what would be the answer? And if any part of that answer has to do with you, or if anything, if any way I answer that question begins with I, that's not the right answer. Because of Jesus. It's nothing I've done. It's because of Jesus. Jesus sought me out. Jesus came to my well. Jesus told me everything about me. I didn't do any of that. It was all the work of Jesus. And Jesus is my Savior. He can be your Savior if he isn't already. Today, you can make him your Savior. You can give your life to him. You can't pray your way out of a mess. You can't work your way out of a mess. You can't speak your way out of a mess. But you can follow your way out by following Jesus. It happens with Matthew. The tax collector cheat, Jesus publicly calls Matthew out and says, come follow me. Everything else will take care of itself, but come follow me. Listen, the Samaritan woman didn't go through an eight-week how to share your faith class before she ran into town. She didn't go through a, a whole year-long membership class in order to join a church. All she did was she heard what Jesus said to her and she ran into town and said, I can't keep this to myself. So I come back to the questions as we close this morning. Where's your well? Have you met Jesus? If so, where's your well? Is there joy? Is there joy in your life? Maybe you met Jesus 20 years ago, but boy, it sure doesn't look it, like it. There's a saying in our home sometimes, you need to tell your face that. <laughs> yeah, I met Jesus 20 years ago. It sure doesn't look like it. Be reminded of grace in your own life. Write it down, write it out. And I challenge you to, to share it. Put yourself in uncomfortable positions and circumstances. Don't be somebody's no. I mentioned live nativity coming up here in a couple of weeks, two weekends from now, actually. You can I know it's difficult to meet your neighbors. This time of year, it's a little easier because they're coming out of their houses. Neighbors are starting to come out. I challenge you, just, just extend an invitation. You never know what God will do through a simple invitation. Would you pray with me? God, I pray that in this room this morning, 
If there's anybody in the room who's never said yes to Jesus, who's never given their life fully and completely, that they would just simply say this prayer, Jesus, I recognize I've been chasing after all the wrong things in my life. I recognize that my sin has separated me from you. And I recognize that Jesus is my Messiah. and He's my Savior. And I know that he paid the price on the cross for my sin. He defeated death. And now he sits at your right hand. And I pray that they just cry out to you. And give their life to you. And God, I pray that you would hear their prayer through the power and the work of the Holy Spirit, even right now. And that afterwards, they would tell somebody. That they would not be able to contain it, that they would tell somebody. They'd tell the person sitting next to them. They'd tell the person who invited them. They'd tell somebody before they leave today. God, thank you for loving us first and inviting us into a lifelong, eternity-long relationship with you. We, we take a moment and we pray for the event in two weeks. God, I thank you for all the work that's gone into it. And that's your event. It's not about us. It's your event. I pray you use it. You draw the people here who need to be here. You draw thirsty people here that night so that they might realize this is a safe place, a place of no condemnation, a place where they can come to know the Savior of the world, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. I'm so glad that you joined us for today's service. Let me leave you with a few next steps that you can take. Number one, let us know that you're participating online. You can make a comment there in the notes. You can send me an email or you can give the church a call. Just let us know. We'd love to add you to our email list that updates our people on what is happening in the life of the church. Number two, if there's something I can specifically be praying for you about, I can give that prayer request. I will pray for you, but I can also give that to our prayer team. A third next step that you can take, if you've been encouraged by the ministry of Boulder Mountain, even though you've maybe never been here physically, uh, let me encourage you to give. We believe that giving teaches us contentment. When we recognize that God's been generous to us, so at Boulder Mountain, we give first, we save second, then we live on the rest. So there's an opportunity for you to participate in giving through our church website. If there's anything else that I can be doing for you or, or Boulder Mountain can do for you by sending you resources, simply let us know. Otherwise, let me pray for you as we close our service. And so for those, Father, who are not here in the room, we recognize church is not a building we come and sit in. So wherever they are at, we know and we believe that, Jesus, you are with them. So I pray that they would sense your presence and your power. Holy Spirit, give them the wisdom to know what to do, and then give them the courage to do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you this week.